welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, although sometimes it feels like I'm not. It's been a mad couple of weeks, I think not only for myself, but many others. I've been on tour a bit with a few out-of-town dates coming up in the diary. Sometimes I think, why do I live in London if loads of my work is around the UK? A friend of mine put this really well when he described the room that he rents in London as expensive storage. I reckon that's something many musicians can relate to. Some examples of this type of lifestyle include getting the early train down from Glasgow to cram in some teaching during a day off before heading to the next city the following day, being home for about 12 hours, most of which you spend sleeping, Living out of your suitcase, even when you're at home, and then deciding not to put the suitcase away when you are home, because you feel you'll just have to pull it out again in a week or two. And the laundry. Oh God, the laundry. The increasing piles of laundry. But I feel really grateful to be able to have this mobility within the country. For example, waking up in Glasgow and be teaching on the other end of the island by 2pm. It's incredible. I don't think this would be possible in New Zealand or Australia where everything is a plane ride or a lengthy car journey away. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm moaning, so I will say it's thrilling to be working in a variety of different places all the time, but very much illustrates the need for days off when you can get them. Also, I can barely speak above this register and dynamic due to lack of sleep recently. Anyway, my guest today is David Marnie. Our chat comes from a galaxy far, far away, (laughs) not really, Birmingham. We caught up backstage while on tour with Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, live in concert, which he was conducting, and I was very lucky to be playing in the orchestra. I learned a lot about conducting a live score along to a film, including David's preparation approach and what he has to deal with on stage. We start our chat with a discussion on the pronunciation of his surname. Have a listen to my chat with David. Yeah, so officially, yeah. it's Marnie. Marnie. That's good because there was a boy at my primary school who pronounced it the same way, but I've heard it like Mahoney. Yeah, and... you know, I get that, all sorts. Yeah. I mean, in America, it would be Mahoney. Really? Have you seen Police Academy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. And there's a. As a, the, there's one of the main characters is Mahoney. Mahoney. One of the policemen. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I get like shum all the time, but it's shum. Shum. And I have to tell people, no, it's shum, rhymes with bum. Because <laughs> <laughs> mine would have been, this is boring, uh, but it would have been O'Mahony in oh, the original sure. Irish. Yeah. O'Mahony. And then the O disappeared in Mahoney, 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 apparently. Yeah. People get lazy. But I get this, I, I can't be bothered to correct people usually. Yeah. Just go with the flow. Yeah, that's fine. It is what it is. <laughs> so, David Marnie, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. We are currently backstage in Birmingham Arena, or Arena Birmingham, I should really say. And we are currently show number four of five of Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. We're almost there. We're almost the there. home straight. <laughs> so, two more shows. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling good. It's these tours are such a huge thing to put together, but by this point in the tour, I know that the orchestra kind of know what they're doing. It makes my life in theory a lot easier. And I think because you have such a lot to put together before show number 1, that the first those first 48 hours rehearsal and then the run through on the first day of the of the first performance and then the performance itself are really quite stressful. I think there's a lot of music and a lot of things to worry about anyway, but then there's this constant sort of stress at the back of my mind thinking, will it all collapse? Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably why you didn't want to do this interview yeah, <laughs> on the exactly. first day. A lot on my mind. Yeah. But, um, but by now, I think what's really nice as well, and you notice it quite strongly, that as the players get more comfortable with the, with the music and, and with the click track, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit, <laughs> You start sensing that they're really they take they really engage and take more con- more sort of control over what they're playing, and as a result of that, the the results are, are, are just quite extraordinary actually. So mm. there's a real step up every single show yep. from from the orchestra and what they give back as they relax into it. Yeah, you know? 
I think from a player's point of view, it's a very nice feeling when you turn the page and you know what is coming up, yeah. as opposed to that first initial sight read run through. Um, I mean, there are still some pages. Don't get me <laughs> wrong. There's pages. a lot of pages in this film. <laughs> Sometimes I turn and go, have I seen this before? <laughs> um, but no, I know exactly how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. So going into this, were you a Star Wars fan? Are you a Star Wars fan? Um, I... No, not really. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> I, I really I appreciate them. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I've always been a massive fan of the music. I, I can't say I'm very knowledgeable on the films. Um, I think I would have watched them uh, with my family sort of growing up, but it was a long time ago, as I'm greying slightly. <laughs> um, I won't reveal my age. Yeah, so I can't say I was a huge fan, but the opportunity to play this music in its original format, which if you think we're very, very fortunate, if you think about it really, unless you're doing this particular show, no one ever gets to perform the whole score from start to finish. You know, you have your selected highlights, you've got the orchestral suites, which are done left, right and centre. But to to actually, in one three-hour concert, or just under three hours, to actually play that whole score is an unbelievable privilege, really. Yeah. I mean, even if... You th- and, it, and it's difficult as well, because even the people, the orchestra, well, the LSO, that recorded it um, originally for the, the soundtrack... They would never have played it from start to finish. No way. Um, track by track. It, it totally. Well, yeah. even bar by bar sometimes, yeah. you know, it's down to the real nitty gritty. And they do like eight bar phrases here and there and then just patch it all together. But um, so actually the, the stamina of it has never yeah. really been tested until the people know. doing this this concert. Yeah. I feel extremely fortunate to be in a position to be able to, to do this and to be able to, to share in this music making with such amazing musicians. So I noticed that there are so many of these concerts popping up around the country, around the world, these live film soundtrack concerts. How did you get into conducting film music, this sort of avenue? If we go back musically, my background is completely different to this. Going back in the day, uh, I come from a choral music background. Mm Mm-hmm. Voice was my first instrument, um, and I was a, a chorister as a boy, a boy treble, and then I, I went on to be a, a choral scholar at, at university. But throughout that time, I was also a cellist, actually. Oh, so that's cool. where the, introdu- yeah. uh, the introduction to the orchestral repertoire came. But when I started conducting, it was always uh, the combination of orchestra and vocalists. Mm. So the shows that I started doing often relating specifically to musical theatre mm-hmm. as a theme. Um, and we're doing a lot of those kind of shows and then sort of these big kind of gala celebrations with orchestra and vocalists and then dancers. And then the film thing came about kind of by accident, to be honest. Yeah. I uh, was in touch with Disney in LA and we were talking about what I really wanted to do actually was one of their kind of generic Disney celebrations. So, you know, all the, the, the big songs from different films with vocalists. It was mm. the next kind of step that I wanted to take in terms of the shows that I was putting on staging. And as it happened, uh, a promoter, who's was a good friend of mine, who was the promoter of this tour, um, happened to be in LA. And I said, well, why don't you pop along to Disney? I've been in touch with them. Uh, and so I set up this meeting with him and the representatives of Disney and then uh, out of that meeting came, a, they got they hit, really hit it off. They had a great relationship straight away, and Disney were very keen, rather than the highlight show, to do these films with live orchestra. Yeah, and yeah. I think they had they'd started doing them uh, in London, and they had a really good relationship with the Albert Hall. But then uh, they needed a promoter to come on board to do all the regional dates, and that's how that started. And as, as a result, um, Ollie, who's the promoter, asked whether I would be interested in looking after the music for it. Yeah. So the first one we did was in 2017, mm-hmm. only a couple of, year, uh, of years ago. Uh, and we were at the Royal Festival Hall with Jungle Book. Oh, right. That was the first yeah. uh, film to like... Great music that in did. that one. I mean, it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Um, in relation to the ones we've done since then, looking back, that was a quite a straightforward one. <laughs> yeah. It didn't feel like that at the time, but yeah. uh, that was what, what kicked it off. And since then, we've done titles such as La La Land, mm-hmm. that was really good. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, the the new Beauty yep. and the Beast. We did a 
date tour of that in 2018. And then we started with the Star Wars franchise. Yeah. So we did uh, A New Hope yes. at the end of last year. And then this is the second in that series. And in yeah. between, we did a really, a really fun one, Pixar, in concert. Oh, yeah. That's brilliant. With uh, little montages from, yeah. from each of the movies. It's a weird phenomenon. And I don't know how long it'll go for, you know, as, as long as people keep coming back and enjoying it. But I think what I love about it is how many stories I hear from people who have come to see an orchestra for the first time yeah. through this medium. That's the thing. It's bringing in new audiences, totally. people that wouldn't necessarily go to an, a purely orchestral concert, but they'd go watch the film. Exactly. And, and, and they're the genuinely there. blown away by it. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and seeing the musicians and the power of the sound. And yeah. I think as long as we can encourage new audiences and sort of introduce them in this way then I think it's it's a great thing it's a good thing yeah and I think it also just hearing your journey really sounds like a, a classic story of being in the right place at the right time totally I mean when I I set up the Novello Orchestra back in 2011 with um basically just a group of friends who I'd grown up with yeah in the sort of youth orchestra circles and I was organizing a little festival for for charity mm. and uh, I put together this group of musicians and I, I needed a name and I don't know how I came up with the Novella Orchestra but that happened and that was in 2011 and to think that well seven years six or seven years later we were doing tours of the major concert halls and, and now arenas in front of sort of 4,000 people yeah it's quite extraordinary actually so but I'm, I'm very lucky that you know I it's 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 only down to the the musicians that I share that stage with and actually a core group with I mean Star Wars we've got 74 players on stage I think there must be a group of at least 15 to 20 that have been performing with the orchestra since 2011 since the and there are some that are in that very first performance wow that we did the uh, charity performance the charity performance wow. it was yeah. in a converted church in front of about 150 people <laughs> and yes they, they sort of shared this journey with me yeah. and uh, I'm very grateful for it. It's really nice to get to that position when you can look back on your journey and just think, wow, like Absolutely. how far have I come and, and really be proud and take ownership of But also that. never take anything for granted. I still, Absolutely, yeah. there's a picture uh, in my house that takes pride of place and it's a, a framed black and white picture of the finale of that very first concert. I make sure that I can always see that every day just to remind myself where it all started yeah. and, and sort of how we've got to here. Uh, and it sort of grounds me a little bit, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You can't just be like, oh, well, I'm here because purely because of I'm just awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely not because of that. <laughs> but, you know, it's just taking stock of what has led you along this yeah, journey. Totally. Yeah, totally. I never set out to do this. Yeah. Uh, and actually conducting itself isn't my... I wouldn't call myself first and foremost a conductor. I do a lot of producing and creative directing for various different music uh, music projects and, and events um but I, and it, it's quite a rarity i guess to share those things in terms of my career so often you, it's not often you find conductors who do anything else apart from conducting and then people have always asked you know when am i going to choose which one i really want to focus on but actually yeah. you know I, I quite like the variety yeah and uh you know for me Depend, it depends on the project as well. I personally, I wouldn't go and conduct something that I didn't think was really relevant uh, to the yeah. kind of repertoire that I like to do and I like to sh that the Novella Orchestra brand to do as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've kind of made a name for ourselves as an orchestra that does repertoire that's a, a little bit out of the ordinary mm -hmm. and specialised in film music, but also uh, sort of musical theatre stuff and anything really that's kind of I really love the rhythm section led uh, yeah. stuff uh, and I think it's something we've become very good at mainly through the way we choose our players so what I love is that if you take this orchestra for example that they're playing on, on the Star Wars tour there's a lot of them who obviously play with all the ma lots of major orchestras around the UK and sort of very knowledgeable of the, of the symphonic repertoire but there's a core group of them is also who whose bread and butter is made up of West End pit playing yeah I think that's a really exciting combination which you don't actually get very often I mm. think that's what sets us apart maybe from a lot of other orchestras yeah it's just yeah. a really 
exciting, young, fresh sound. It's interesting what you say about how you, you like to have that variety in your career, and I imagine that a lot of the people in the Novello Orchestra are the same, and they probably share that um, that approach to music. I myself, I like to do a little bit of everything, and I imagine lots of other people in the orchestra are freelancers as well. And so I think when you get a whole group of people together in the same room with that same approach, as who, you say... We're all really passionate about what they're doing. Yeah. You know, I, we could go on for ages about my thoughts on orchestral, professional orchestral musicians generally. I, th- I find it a real shame sometimes, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to name any names, but oh. sometimes you, as a conductor, if you stand in front of a group of musicians who don't really want to be there, <laughs> and you're trying to give all you can give, and you just get these blank expressions back, it makes it really difficult. And not only does it make it really difficult, they can be technically perfect, but it just lacks that energy yeah. and, it, and you can really tell in terms of the sound that they create. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a problem I've never had with these musicians yeah. because they're just genuinely pleased to be here Excited, and have the opportunity yeah. and, and and it comes across, it totally comes across in the sound that's, yeah. that's created. Because it's not every day you get to play, as, as you say, you know, it's a real privilege to be playing these films all the way through. And I think most people, when they get asked, oh, do you want to do this tour playing Star Wars they'll be genuinely really excited and it is a kind of maybe not once in a lifetime opportunity but it's not often that I mean this this film won't come back to the UK now for for a long time Mm -hmm. you know this is the UK tour and and then we move on yeah so um it's 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 hard to become really jaded you know not like say someone sitting at the back of a particular section playing Beethoven 5 for the hundredth time that year (laughs) yeah exactly exactly yeah so touching on a little bit on um your career as you mentioned this is just one aspect of your career so you probably got loads of different projects going on how would you describe a typical week if there is <laughs> yeah, in your say, life. <laughs> the way I describe it is there is never a typical week. My typical week can be literally anything. So aside from the sort of more musical projects, just to run through a few of the examples of projects that, that I work on, I, with my producer hat on, I, I'm responsible for the, the Welsh BAFTAs, the BAFTA Awards, in which I'm responsible for literally everything that, that happens on stage in oh. obviously quite a prestigious award yeah. ceremony. So I've been doing that for five years. And in addition to that, I can do a lot of consulting with clients like UEFA. So I, every year I fly out to wherever the Champions League final right. is taking place. And I consult on the entertainment surrounding the, yeah. the, the final celebrations. So although it is varied, it all, it, is, it is all kind of related. And actually what's really interesting is, and the way I justify it, if you like, is that when you're, creative directing or producing and I'm looking out for, for detail and and how maybe a bigger picture is put together through finer details it's actually quite similar to conducting sure it's yeah. like I'm conducting a creative team yeah um, you're bringing together so many different different things. aspects yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm sure it is related in somehow but yeah so my typical day can be anything from traveling to some exotic place in the world with, with business uh, to sitting for hours on end marking up a score to learning a click track <laughs> to writing up a, a schedule for my production team yeah. and then also like a lot of my projects are run through my own production company so I, I can never sort of rest I always have to be thinking of, of what the next project's going to be yeah. and what's around the corner and sort of develop some ideas mm-hmm. and try and pitch those to various clients and and, and make the work happen in yeah. the first place. You know, I'm, I am fortunate that there's enough sort of repetitive work to the, the phone does go quite often and ask, you know, people asking me to do things, which is lovely, but, but actually, and something I'm very aware of that I would never have been in this position if I didn't do something entrepreneurial and and created something myself in the first place Mm. Um, and often people ask me how how did it all start and or how do I get to be doing the kind of things that you're doing and it's my answer is always that you can't afford to wait for the opportunity to come along I know it's a bit of a cliche but the only way I started doing big things and, and more importantly meeting the right kind of people was I literally just sat down at home one day and thought I'm going to create something here, and I'm going to, and that's where this festival started, yeah. the Cardiff Music Festival, back in 2011. And it was only as a result of me thinking, I'm just going to make something happen, yeah. that people sort of started 
paying me a little bit of attention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you just got to go out there putting, and putting and do it, don't yeah. you? Because um because otherwise, if you're just gonna wait for the phone to call before you show that any of your work actually exists, then you're gonna be waiting <laughs> totally. a long, long time, totally. aren't you? And it's um it's hard as well because then you a lot of people maybe decide not to approach you for things because they assume that you only do your own projects. Right. You know, and you only you only work on your own productions, and that's not necessarily true either. Because I like to have a, have a combination. It just means you always have to be thinking what's around the corner. Yeah, and you've got to, you've got to be prepared. So, on the topic of preparing, mm-hmm. I'd l- quite like to know about how you prepared for this concert for Star Wars. So I can see in the corner of my eye. I can see two very fat scores for Act One and Act Two of Empire Strikes Back, and I just basically want to know, and I'm sure a lot of listeners would like to know, how does it actually all work? You've got a screen in front of you. How do you follow a click? It's not as straightforward as just waving your baton in time with a beep in your ear. Yeah. There's so much complexity, especially with John Williams. You have to be very fluid, but at the same time, very, very strict. And what's your approach? It's really difficult, actually, because a lot of the things that happen when you're preparing for this kind of show aren't what you would do instinctively. And that's instinctively in terms of pre- preparing for, for a show, uh, but also instinct what you would do instinctively from a musical point of yeah, view. Yeah, from what you've been trained to do your entire exactly. life. Exactly. Like, so, for example, like tempo changes. Tempo changes, uh, writs, uh, mm-hmm. and just you're limited in that you can't necessarily put as much as of your personal stamp on something that yeah. you maybe would like to. Mm-hmm. But then it's quite helpful sometimes to have a bit of a click. <laughs> um, so to answer your question properly, the first thing I would do, I'm, I'm usually sent the scores maybe three to four months before the tour starts. Oh, that's nice. Which is lovely. Would you like to know when I got to see the music for the first time? Uh, about five minutes before the first <laughs> rehearsal. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, it's, a, good, it's a, a testament to my sight reading chops that I'm still here today. <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing I will do is just have a, obviously a, a general scan of it musically. and But quite quickly, I will start to to read through it with the click. Yeah. Because... If you don't do that, you kind of start... Even if you're listening to the soundtrack as a reference, what's quite interesting is often it's the tempi in the soundtrack that are on the highlight CD, for example, mm. are slightly different to how they do it here. Because when they would have recorded these films originally, they may have had some sort of click track um, device that they used, but it wouldn't have been as, as accurate as the kind of things that we can yeah. use now. So this click has been placed onto the film. I actually like. heard a rumour that John Williams didn't use click. He well, that would make a of, lot of sense. He just sort of conducted organically as, yeah. as it went along with the film and then someone put all those tempo changes and clicks and retroactively... Onto it, which yeah. would explain why, for example, if you have a passage of music which on the music looks like it's in one tempo, sometimes you'll hit a bar and there'll be no markings you can just feel it just slightly sits back or it slightly moves forward and every single one of those moments I have to make sure they're really marked up in my score so the f- the first thing I do before I even learn the music I think it's more important that, that I learn this kind of click map and become really accustomed to what, what it does and, and how it moves and then after doing that then I would do all my kind of real sort of in-depth musical you're conducting stuff exactly and sort of really kind of absorb what the score is and actually then start to realize how clever this music is do you watch the film with the score with the score totally i do and because in addition to the click i have a screen in front of me um for the performance and on that screen i see all the pictures of the film but with a system called punches and streamers this is what i want to know yes right so punches and streamers we, we don't get on that well, um, but no, but they can be very useful. So basically, they have two purposes, I'd say. The first one is that when we've had a passage in the film that doesn't have any music, and I must admit, in in this Star Wars film, there isn't a lot of that. Mm. Um, but for example, we if we finished a musical number, there might be say one and a half minutes until the next moment. So that screen will tell me it will give me a countdown. Yes. So I can see exactly when we're expecting the next piece of music. I'll start with the the punch often will just give me a little flash. There'll be a little sort of circular flash in the middle of the screen and it's not a fine art because it's not, it's not that consistent, 
but there'll be certain moments in the score. Uh, that, so on the score, it marks where the puncher is. Does okay. that make sense? So sure, where this time, yeah, but it's yeah. not, for example, it's not the downbeat of every bar. It might be like every four bars or just as a kind of, so subconsciously I can just see that flick on a downbeat. But then if there are any kind of important time changes or mm-hmm. if there's a writ, for example, I see a streamer. So a streamer is basically a thick line mm. that just appears on the left of my screen and it starts appearing there and it just moves at a consistent speed okay. and it arrives, the moment it arrives at the end of the screen, so sort of the far right of the, of the screen, is when something happens. So if there's a writ, for example, the yep. start of the writ, I'll see this bar appear and then I'll know that when that bar hits the end of the screen, that's the downbeat to the next bar. Okay. Which in theory sounds really clever and really helpful. Mm. But actually, if you're in time, if you're in a tempo and you've got the writ and the click starts to slow up, this streamer that comes across your screen, it doesn't indicate any time, any no. tempo, because it's just a consistent speed. Yeah, so you just have to kind of pace it you just yourself kind of guess. somehow. Yeah. yeah, so for example, if like... I don't want to get too technical, but if you're <laughs> if you've got a, a big writ and there's a, a held fourth beat, mm. so it could be the first three beats of the bar are consistent. So we, but then you kind of hold that third beat on a pause, a, a short pause. Say, you've just kind of got to guess when you're going to give the upbeat because in in the time that this bar goes from the left to the right of your screen, you've got to judge when there's an upbeat and when the downbeat should fall. And also coincide that with the click that you're hearing. Totally. So, and knowing what the new tempo is going to be. <laughs> so it's wow. kind of one of those things. I think if you think about it too much, it, it would just be overwhelming. You've yeah. kind of just got to kind of internalize it all a little bit. You've yeah. just got to feel it and physicalize it. It's, and it's a little bit like choreography, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, I imagine that's why it's so useful to have the scores so many months in advance. Totally. Then, yeah, as you say, you internalize it and you can just predict a little bit more yeah. and see how it coincides with what's happening in the film exactly. as well. So there's a lot going on. There's a, I've got my scores in front of me. I've got a <laughs> little screen in front of me with all these punches and streamers. And it also tells me the bar numbers. Mm-hmm. And then I've got a click in my ear. And on top of all that, I've got to worry about a 74-piece orchestra. Easy, right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, so there is a lot going on. But, you know, it's, it's exciting. Yeah. It is really exciting. And, you know, you do get used to it and, and improve uh, yeah. as, as you go. It's a new sort of skill, isn't it? Because I, I don't really know if this is what people are learning in music colleges. No, I, I doubt you know? if you, anyone you go gets to college. trained at it. I kind of, you just have to get jumping at the deep end yeah. and sort of... And make l- it work. Learn on the job, I imagine. And actually, I think it probably a lot of conductors would probably, a lot of very fine conductors would struggle with it because, as I said, we said earlier, it, sometimes it goes so against what you expect or what you instinctively want to do with it musically. Yeah, but you can't that, do that. But you, you have no choice but <laughs> to go with it. And I think it would probably annoy a lot of conductors. Yeah. But, um, but it's brilliant and, and, you know, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Do you feel absolutely naked at the end of every show? It's absolutely absolutely exhausting i mean not only physically it's exhausting yeah but also uh mentally when all that's going on and i think <laughs> there's so much focus because it and it's happened to me a few times don't tell anyone on this tour so there'll be like if i have a moment momentary lapse of concentration and i kind of conduct a three four bar and two four or something <laughs> <clears throat> definitely did that a few times but um it that's all it takes it's literally just a, yeah. a split second that I, and, it, and actually the reason that happened was because I was starting to think of it was in the middle of performance and something had gone wrong not wrong but something had shaken a little bit I thought oh I must look at that in the rehearsal tomorrow and as I was thinking that oh yeah I forgot that the, the film does continue yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah but it's just an example of literally you just can't switch off for a split mm-hmm. second it's com- you complete complete focus yeah hence uh, the coffee right here at all times yeah hence the <laughs> a lot of caffeine going on yeah um, and it's, I think, the stress of that mentally actually pro- probably affects me physically as well. Yeah. Because I think, you know, mu- I'm sure it has all muscular connections and everything. But it means that I, I, when I walk off stage at the end of a show, it's, yeah, I'm pretty drained. I imagine you just need I'm some drained. peace and quiet. And- to be honest yeah. with you, all I really want is a bed because the... Uh, not such a glamorous thing about these tours is that I sleep on a tour bus. <laughs> yes, that's right. So you travel with the crew. I travel the production with, crew with the crew the night. from venue to venue. So we literally, I'll walk off stage at quarter past ten or whatever okay. it is. Then I'll have a bit of quiet time. I think it's really important. That I just decompress. Yeah, and just get a moment of calm. 
And then I'll pack my things up, I'll have a shower, and I will go onto the tour bus and I'll wait a few hours while the crew are doing the D-rig. Mm-hmm. And I'll get on my bunk <laughs> on this tour bus. And we, we literally, yeah, we travel overnight to, to the next venue. And, and then we're in the next venue around, probably arrive at about six or seven in the morning. Oh. And then at eight o'clock, that crew who have only just got into bed at about two or three o'clock are up. And they're they're setting everything up. Fair play to them. It's um, That's a big it's actually job. it's extraordinary what they do. Yeah, it really is. And and, and here we are. We we moan because we've got to get an eight o'clock train from Glasgow back to London. Exactly. <laughs> we've but, got it all right. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So and it's a real team effort. I think what what I love about and maybe it's my producer hat as well because I've I've seen things from the other side of, of of the stage that these tours it's for me it's a, it is a big family it's a big team effort and that isn't isn't just talking about the musicians but every department you know yep. from from caterers to bus drivers to truck drivers i think often that's quite overlooked mm. so i try to try my best to make an effort and and, and thank the caterers all the time because they're very important yeah. but also to just to what i hate about some situations where musicians just wouldn't kind of interact with with those kind of people, yeah. uh, with 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 crews and and technical teams, but what I've I try to instill is a kind of atmosphere where we all appreciate that we're all just as important as each other. Absolutely, you know the the back desk of second violins is just as important as any of the technical team, any of the sound visual. People work well when they feel valued. Yeah. yeah, and it's um it's just really important that it takes every single one of those people to make this tool work. And without one of those, it's not the same. So let's move on. So I told you there'd be some surprise questions. Uh This is, (laughs) everyone always says that. It's a little bit of a tradition in in my podcast. This is the wild card question round. So basically, you get to choose what I ask you next based on three choices. Okay. (laughs) So if there's something which you just think, oh, you can just say no, you can veto. (laughs) Scary. Uh, It's not that scary. Okay. But the thing is, I've never been in this situation because I've never interviewed myself. So... Of course. Yes. So you don't know what, I don't know what really how scary. Is. Like, what are you talking about? It's not scary. Okay. I feel like I'm on a quiz show. It's oh, great. Great. Well, <laughs> bit of variety, as we said. It's always good. So you have dream gig. Okay. Life away from music. Or food. <laughs> <laughs> Vague. Let's go with. Let's mix this up. Let's go with life away from music. Wonderful. I'm always very interested in what musicians do outside of music yeah. because I think it's it's really important that in a way to ground ourselves in, in what we do to have parallels going mm-hmm. on as well. What's the next non-musical thing you get to do? The next non-musical thing I get to do is probably more stressful than any music. I'm in the middle <laughs> of... Uh, I'm about to move into a new house. <gasps> oh, congratulations! And all the craziness that comes with that. So yeah, me, have you bought a place? I so I I have a, a property. Yeah. Uh, but I lived the bachelor life in uh-huh. that property for the last eight years. And the scary bit about this is that uh, I am buying a house for the first time with my par- with my partner, um, and and her two kids. So this is going to be a big <laughs> lifestyle change. Yeah, all of a sudden. Um, so, so yeah, there's going to be Joe, my partner, her two, she's got two daughters. So I'm going to be a bit outnumbered. <laughs> and I know they're going to be very, very strict about right. my h- homely habits. Not that there's anything particularly bad. Mm-hmm. But um, I know that they get very frustrated when I spend a long time in the shower. <laughs> but for me, the shower, right? I don't know about you. That is my moment to think. Yeah, it's a great I, place to contemplate. I do my contemplate. thinking. I do. I I have yeah clarity mm-hmm. of thought, but then I have like an angry shout from the other side of the door to tell <laughs> me to stop wasting water. Hurry up! Um, I need the yeah. shower. So I think we're going to have a a lot of that maybe. You're going from living solo to I am indeed, shared to sharing. living. Thankfully, I'm going to have a, a little office set up in the house, yeah. so that's where I can escape to. Yeah, if it's you, all getting too much. <laughs> you need your own space, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so that's we're in that kind of crazy, uh, in the middle of all the sort of sur- surveys and, and lawyers. You and, know what? I'm I'm in the middle of uh, this as well. Are you really? Yeah, and it's such a stressful situation. But and also very boring as well. I mean, like, totally. because you're just waiting for the next phone call from this person. This conveyance is talking to that conveyancer, and you're waiting for the as you can search imagine, to come back. As a conductor, uh, I'm a bit of a control freak mm-hmm. in a lovely way. But 
buying a house is one of those situations where you just can't be in control. Yes, you have to relinquish control. You're so reliant on things happening yeah. with other people, and I really don't like it. It puts me on edge. No, I relate to that as well. I, I, I like to be able to get things done yeah. straight away. Exactly, um, efficiently. But you're kind of at the mercy of all these different people. But hopefully, yeah. fingers crossed, we're, all, you know, we're at the start of October, and if all things go to plan we'll, I'll be in the house in the, in the, the final week of October and then the, the stress of actually doing bits and bobs of work to actually make it the dream the dream space but yeah so that is the normal mm-hmm. life side of things that sounds very similar to mine <laughs> <laughs> great and hopefully in your new house you can enjoy some wonderful rugby world cup matches oh it's been wonderful. Congratulations, so, Wales, for being in Australia. Do you know what? I mentioned that in front of the orchestra at rehearsal uh, two days ago. And I, for some reason in my head, I thought there were a lot more Welsh people in the, <laughs> in the orchestra. Uh, but I didn't get that much of a good response. Well, I'm a Welsh appreciator. I, okay. was, I was sitting at the back then. I was like, yeah. They're dotted around. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, we arrived actually in Glasgow. And I knew that kickoff, kickoff was at quarter to nine in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I had to kind of weigh up, do I have an extra hour in bed <laughs> or do I not? But I couldn't even face that. So I was out of that tall bus, straight into my dress room, TV was on. <laughs> and I've never had such a stressful two hours of my life. It was it a was, nail biter. Oh, it was, yeah. it was, I, thought, I thought we'd blown it. Mm-hmm. I thought the second half especially. I mean, Australia were by far the better side, but... The Welsh passion came through yeah, in the end, yeah. and they, they 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 never give up, the boys. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm hopeful. Yeah, I'm very, very good. Hopeful. I was sitting with an Australian on the train, and I'm not Australian, as yeah. everyone knows. I'm a Kiwi, um, and I was following it on my app, and I was like, "Oh my God, look, Australia have lost to Wales," and she just said, "I, I don't care." <laughs> but who knows? Maybe we'll see well, an All Blacks. I- Wales. Let's hope match if, if we do. Point. Let's hope it's the final because, <laughs> yeah, it's there. I I'm in awe of the All Blacks. Oh yeah, it's it's always a treat to watch them. They've got a match tomorrow. They do. Who are they playing? Canada. Okay. Mm. I think you'll be right. Yeah, I think so. Canada followed by Namibia. Again, yeah. <laughs> We could be talking record score there. <laughs> yeah, totally. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Where can people follow you or find you? That's a very good question. I do have social media accounts, but I'm what? What are they actually? What are the ha- handles? Let me think. <laughs> you can follow me on Instagram at David underscore Marnie, spelt Mahoney, confusingly, and on on Twitter it's something similar. You'll find out. <laughs> have a have a little Google search. Uh, and the Novello Orchestra also has its own accounts to keep up to date with all our future plans. There's a few exciting announcements to come for tours in 2020. That's Watch this space. Wow, that's really weird to think that 2020 is just next year because it sounds like it's well into the future. Not only is it next year, it's about three months away, <laughs> which is oh, even scarier. Oh, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's been great. <laughs> That was David Marnie, conductor and multitasker extraordinaire. It was such a treat to play in these concerts with such an energetic buzz both in the audience and the orchestra. And if you know me, you'll know I love Star Wars. Might be wearing my Star Wars t-shirt right now. Anyway, I love this particular film. This is the one with the best musical themes, I reckon. The Imperial March, Yoda's theme... Han and Leia's love theme, even flying through the asteroid field. It's just the best. There's quite a few notes, though. I must say, a few of them did slip through my fingers. Quite literally. (laughs) Anyway, moving on. This episode's Music College Didn't Prepare Me comes from, well, I can't say, because it's another anonymous wedding-related string quartet booking. They begin. I received a phone call from a guy who says, Hi. I'm Marlon Wolf, and I want to get married for seven hours. So a seven-hour booking is made. A little side note, that's a very lengthy booking for a quartet, because in my experience, they're usually about three or four hours maximum. Turns out, he's one of Britain's foremost porn producers, and his bride is the UK's top Princess Diana porn impersonator. The guest list is packed with older, seedy-looking blokes and young women, 
who were constantly disappearing into the bushes, behind trees, and into the loos all day. Ugh, I mean, whatever. No judgment here. But what's the point of having a quartet for entertainment, then? Anyway, if you have a story of something that Music College didn't prepare you for, then do let me know. Email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or send me a message via social media. That's it for today. Special thanks to Roz Nagy for my logo and Dan Elms for my jingle. Galactically massive thanks to David Marnie for taking the time to chat to me between Soundcheck and the show in Birmingham. And finally, thank you for listening. It's great to hear what you think, so get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. Like and follow the pod on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod, where you'll see bonus content such as videos of my talking head and photos of my cat, the assistant producer Romeo. He's actually sitting behind me right now. (laughs) Remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word. Chat to you soon. Bye. (music) Thank <music> you.